All right, we'll uh, get started. Yeah. All right. Hi, I'm Jamal. Uh, welcome to Montreal. I know it's not that it's nice weather. Uh, people submitting papers and slides, please. You know who you are. Submit. Uh, Wi-Fi is working well for everybody. Good. Uh, everybody knows. You know the password. Uh, before we get started, uh, uh, we're looking for scribes, someone who's going to report the sessions. They'll be posted on Linux Weekly News. Either contact, uh, send an email to info at netdevconf.org. Uh, Thursday night, we have uh, what we call bits, bytes, bits, nibbles, bytes, and words uh, session which is going to be outside uh, on the terrace here. If you have an open source project that you want to get a table for and demonstrate something, talk to Christy at the, front, at the registration desk. Uh, give her your name and what the project is. It has to be open source, and marketing is not allowed. You can't start marketing a product or something of that sort. Uh, last announcement, we're not going to be serving lunch this time. But there's plenty of food options. Two floors down, there's a big uh, uh, mall uh, food, court. food court. There's a lot of trucks outside. There's plenty of coffee, though. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alex. Oh, OK. You announced the lunch thing. Then you hand it off to me. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, OK. Mike's working. So my name is Alex Dyke, uh, Alexander Dyke on all the mailing lists. Um, I'm here to present the IOV, or to chair the IOV workshop. Uh, let's see. So basic idea behind the workshop, you know, it's to be collaborative. I, ideally, I want to avoid me spending the full hour and a half just up here presenting. Um, ideally, I want to keep it to 10 to 15 minutes of discussion about any given topic. I have specifically three topics today. Um, and at that point, hopefully this becomes much more collaborative and we can start discussing, you know, Either why I am wrong for thinking of, of doing something a given way, or you know maybe there's something I didn't think about that we can add on, or worst case scenario, it's a, everyone's in agreement, and all of a sudden we can just move on to the next topic. In which case, this might end up being a 45-minute session. So hopefully we get some discussion going. But basically, the schedule is going to be um, 10 to 15 minutes each topic, just to describe the current state of affairs, 5 to 10 minutes discussion proposals, and basically, I want to try to summarize things so that we have some sort of agreement going forward by, by the end of uh, each uh, session. So as far as the areas I was going to cover, um, we got three main areas. We're looking at Mac VLAN offload. Uh, specifically here, this is uh, known as the L2 forward offload. Um, right now, it's only implemented on the Intel parts. Um, but hopefully, that will change in the future. Uh, second item is SROV using uh, para virtualization in this in standard case it's vert IO, but also NetVSC falls into this as well as the standby path. And the last bit is uh, vhost data path acceleration. This is actually an area that I'm not uh, necessarily the most familiar with. Hopefully, there might be some other people in the audience. If Michael's around, he probably has dealt with it quite a bit. Um, uh, I just want to get some discussion going on it because I know it's been going on. There's been a lot of discussion on other mailing lists about it, but not necessarily NetDev. So Mac VLAN offload. As I mentioned before, it's uh, referred to as L2 forward offload, which maybe that's you know, something we can look into, making it more generic, actually applying it to something other than just Mac VLAN. But that's for more of the uh, it's discussion towards the end. Um, but Mac VLAN offload, specifically the L2 forward offload, as a means of directing traffic from a given Mac VLAN interface to a specific set of um, TXQs or, or from a specific set of RXQs to a specific Mac VLAN device. Um, basically, it's just a means of providing a quick bypass for Mac VLAN traffic so it can get quickly from the Mac VLAN to the lower dev or from lower dev directly into the Mac VLAN. In the case of the Intel parts, we end up using a feature called VMDQ, specifically VMDQ2, because it uses both the VLAN and the MAC address. Um, it's a hardware feature that's available and described in our parts and the data sheets. Um, 
And what we end up doing is we end up using that in order to, in the case of IXGBE, we end up using that in order to be able to allow the traffic to get directly from a given set of queues into a Mac VLAN and from the Mac VLAN specifically into that set of TX queues. And then in the case of FM10K, which is one of our other parts, we end up using something that's called a global resource tag to directly route the received traffic and we don't actually bother with the RX because we don't have the uh, uh, TX rate limiting feature enabled in FM10K for that functionality and so we don't need to reserve any TX queues for it. Anyway, if you've been following the NetDev mailing list, I've been going through and doing a bunch of work. Um, like I mentioned, IXGBE, FM10K are the two drivers that end up supporting uh, Mac VLAN offload. What I've been doing is going through and fixing the bugs. Um, when I went and first started setting the stuff up, my default config, Mac VLAN offload did not work on either of these drivers. Um, FM10K specifically, it didn't work at all. As it turns out, we had never actually tested that feature. Um, I'd implemented it, and I actually left Intel around that time, just after implementing it, so I never got a chance to test it because the silicon was just coming out when I left. And uh, there were some changes related to VLAN configuration that didn't get uh, applied to the Mac VLAN interface. So uh, in the case of FM10K, it didn't work until we actually set, configured the proper VLAN for the Mac address. In the case of IXGBE, it sort of worked, but it kind of limped along quite a bit. Um, there were TX uh, Q mapping issues, um, coexistence issues with SRIOV. Um, specifically, SRIOV and BMDQ are actually features that kind of compete with each other because they both use up Q resources, and so that became an issue. Um, and the other issue I ran into is the driver just in general took a long time to actually get itself configured. Uh, the way the, the logic was working, it was resetting the, the entire port each time you would add a new Mac VLAN interface. And it's a it had limited itself to 32. I had done some work to enable 64, and all of a sudden it's like, why does it take me like a minute and a half in order to just bring down the interface? It's because the Mac VLANs, each time it was adding or removing one, it was resetting the interface and reconfiguring it and bring it back up, and then, oh, remove the next one, reset the interface, bring it back up. And so I had to rewrite a bunch of that. So basically I created certain thresholds where it's like, okay, pre-allocate a set of cues for this new mode versus the old mode. Um, some other specific changes I was making, th these are more related to just Mac VLAN generally. Um, one of the things I was finding is with the offload enabled, various modes didn't work. Um, actually, one thing I didn't call out here, one of the things I fixed is the assumption for the Mac VLAN offload in the IXGBE driver and actually FM10K driver originally was it, it just works, right? It's just one mode. That's just VEPA, right? It's like, oh, wait, no, it's not really VEPA. It's bridge, VEPA source Mac filtering, and I think, was it private? And there's uh, uh, the pass-through mode. It ends up being like six or seven different modes. The problem is when this feature was originally implemented, I don't think most of those existed. Either that or they were overlooked, one of the two. And so it's a matter of going through and identifying, okay, what modes are actually offloadable? And so I basically uh, narrowed the list down to VEPA and uh, Bridge in the case of the IXGBE parts, as well as the FM10K parts. Basically because those are the two modes that we classically think of as being something that would look like a VMDQ style offload that the hardware can actually handle. So source MAC address, we don't have a filter for that. Um, pass through doesn't really need to be offloaded because it's already taken over the whole device. And so a lot of it was just going through and eliminating the cruft out of the code and getting that cleaned up. So what's left to do? Um, so if you've been following the mailing list, I recently submitted a set of patches to Jeff Kersher, and they sat for two weeks in testing, and he asked me to re-base them and resubmit them because some other stuff conflicted. But um, currently they're pending uh, acceptance by Dave to change the TX queuing mechanism for Mac VLANs. Um, one of the issues we ran into is we, uh, or that we've been trying to address is we wanted to be able to add support for Mac VLAN offload to the i40e driver. Problem is, in order to do that, we have to, well, the, the way the queuing logic works in IXGBE, for example, you have to use NDO select queue, which is kind of a, uh, it's really supposed to be deprecated. You know, it's one of those things where it's like every time someone implements it, it's like, no, don't use that. We want that to go away. But then it's one of those things that doesn't go away. But at the same time, it's like, okay, it's a catch-22 now 
because I can't do Mac VLAN offload unless I implement NDO select queue. And so I'll, in order to try to get away from having to do the NDO select queue function, I'm looking at creating um, what I'm calling the subordinate device logic. Basically, it's a way of taking a given net dev and partitioning it up so that it's split between some number of um, pure software net devs. In this case, it's Mac VLAN interfaces. And so I end up reusing bits of the uh, TC to Q mappings on those other net devs, as well as locking them down into what I'm calling a channel. So basically they end up reporting that, oh yeah, this device only supports really uh, one TC and it's single Q. So it doesn't need to look at the DCB code or the, or the TC uh, to Q code, but instead we can now go ahead and reuse that over here in this other net dev, and it'll call back up and figure this out once it knows it's transmitting. And so I had to go through and rewrite some bits here and there in order to make it all work. Um, but I've got the patches currently sitting on the net dev mailing list. Uh, like I said, waiting acceptance. So it's like your last chance to get review in before Dave goes ahead and applies them. So they're still on the uh, list as of today and they're still in patchworks if you're wanting to take a look. And so with that change though, that enables the bits needed so that I can go ahead and then add support for something like Mac VLAN on the I40E driver without having to implement NDO select queue, which I think would be a sticking point on that. So with that said, that's the current state of things. So the question starts becoming, where can we go with this? This is where I'm going to open it up to you guys. So this is just like some random, you know, musings, thoughts that I had. Um, so one of the things I was looking at is we have a few issues here and there dealing with VLANs right now when you throw Mac VLAN offload into the play. We could do, you know, a Mac VLAN with an offloaded VLAN if we wanted to, with a VMDQ2 setup. There's nothing to really prevent that. So in theory, we could have a Mac VLAN exposed NDO ops saying, okay, I'm going to allow a uh, L2 forward offloaded VLAN on top of my Mac VLAN. Or you could do the reverse, say the VLAN has a, a L2 forward offloaded Mac VLAN. It just becomes a matter of defining what ops and features are going to be able to be expressed between the two. Um, the other one I was looking at, so it, the question becomes, is there a way to get away with doing a source address mode make, uh, uh, source address mode based offload? So basically, one of the modes that's available right now in Mac VLAN is uh, source. And so one of the questions becomes, is there any value to doing a Mac VLAN L2 forward offload for source? So like one of the things that actually comes to mind with something like this is switch dev. Right now we have certain parts that do switch dev and ones that can't, but they're still doing uh, Mac v or SRIOV in legacy mode. What if we were to look at creating like this special Mac VLAN that supported source Mac based um, functionality that says, okay, at least then you can take the source Mac address off of that uh, VF and assign it to some net devs, you can figure out, okay, if I see traffic coming on this Mac VLAN, I'm assuming it came from that VF over there. Unless you have something, you know, coming in from some stray other entity on the network, but then that implies a mix of managed, uh, managed and unmanaged network without filtering, which gets kind of messy. But, you know, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. So are there any thoughts on, you know, any of the, those first two so far? Turn it on, Jamal. There we go. That's on. Um, so maybe I'll ask a question that I'm sure a few people have, which is, what are you trying to do here? Um, so, <laughs> like, may, maybe b in the context of Mac VLAN offload, the basic use case is very straightforward, and it's yep. very useful for the container case, for the VM case. Right. The, maybe the higher level question worth asking is, is there something that's not implemented in Mac VLAN that, is, that has a real use case driving it? other than the modes. I mean, of course, there's a whole bunch of modes we can go right. and implement, but is there, one, is there one that's come up? Have people asked for something that specifically could help with acceleration or with some kind of feature being enabled? Well, the, the thought that comes to mind with this is it, it's basically uh, been a lot of the issues around switch dev. And the fact that, okay, switch dev's the way we want to do things going forward, and it becomes a question of, is there a way to make us, or for us to make legacy SROV look like switch dev without actually implementing switch dev. 
And so that's where, in my mind, having some sort of source mode or source MAC address-based MAC VLAN might work because more often than not, in the case of legacy SROV, we still have a statically assigned MAC address and there's a feature called anti-spoofing, um, which prevents that VF from being able to send uh, a packet using anything but that source MAC address. And so in theory, you could then create a set of uh, MAC VLANs that look like switch dev in terms of handling how they handle the traffic. Oh, I see. I I, right. I understand. Okay, so you're trying to make it such that the end user experience looks like it's a switch, right? with lots of ports, but you're using Mac VLAN to emulate that behavior, right? Okay, so it's really more like a source protection or a source guard, and rather than well, the, forward the, the, the source work. source protection is coming from the SRIOV. There's the anti-spoof feature, sure. But then it's the okay. If I have traffic that comes in from here for broadcast, like an ARP packet or something how do I distinguish which VF it came from? So this might be a way to do that. Right, right. So it's still a filtering function. Right. It's not a filtering Yeah, it's okay. a filtering yeah, yeah, function, yeah, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, and so that's just, you know, a couple of things I was thinking. Um, and so another thing is that we've been debating is whether or not we want to do like a new NDO ops, uh, you know, like a Mac VLAN ops uh, like pointer structure to support some advanced offloads. So like some of the stuff like what I've mentioned where, okay, Maybe we need to add support for adding, you know, a certain level of VLAN filtering from a Mac VLAN, since I can support both Mac and VLAN in the uh, VMDQ2 filter. It might make sense to create a accelerated Mac, uh, accelerated VLAN that exists above the accelerated Mac VLAN theoretically, and so I could actually do that as a combination. And so that's another thing I might be, we might look at doing is adding um, a new. Uh, structure full of function pointers essentially just to support something like that. So it'd be yet another uh, function there. Let's see. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, I already mentioned the source mode uh, based switch dev like behavior. Um, so, another one that came up that I actually uh, shot down in internal discussions was the idea of creating a Mac VLAN as a uh, almost a net dev onto itself basically where it would steal the RX queues from the lower device and then just have its own TX queues. The only problem is there are certain situations where we are, uh, at least in the case of IXGBE, where it really restricts what you can do because all of a sudden it becomes something where we have to somehow have a means of either rejecting enabling SROV if it's used up all the VF resource or all the uh, pool resource, the virtualization pool resources, number of other things. Um, and really, I wasn't a fan of having a no queue queue disk. Well, so existing Mac VLAN, if I'm not mistaken, has a no queue queue disk, which means it doesn't actually perform queuing on the uh, a queue disk itself. And so normally, if you take queues from the lower dev and just give them straight to the, the upper dev, it becomes problematic. And right now, the w workaround for that is we end up having to go through a two-stage transmit, which implies a little bit more overhead, but at the same time allows for things like broadcast replication just in software versus hardware. So that was one of the things I actually wanted to get away from is doing any broadcast replication in the hardware because that can get very expensive very quickly when you take something like a uh, you know an ARP and all of a sudden you're having to replicate it 64 times and send it back up the, the PCIe bus. And so I just wanted to try to get away from that as much as possible. And so um, I don't know any thoughts on any of uh, let's see. Oh yeah, and the last one. I'll go ahead and cover that real quick, is uh, the, the, one of the questions that's been coming up is how do we go about configuring queues, interrupts, et cetera, for these Mac e VLAN interfaces? We've got these pool groups that are floating around in the hardware, but we don't have a good way of actually configuring them right now. And so we're wondering if we need to be looking at like a dev link interface, IP, you know, it becomes a where should all this get defined? I can, you know, one of the concerns that we have is, you know, dev link can quickly become a a catch-all for, okay, well, it doesn't fit any of the other tools, let's dump it in there. Is this something we want to look at doing where we want to have a standard way for defining queues, interrupts, et cetera, on these interfaces? This is actually, um, Sridhar will be presenting later uh, some of the issues we've run into with this in terms of defining where you want to, uh, or what you, how you want to have your interfaces configured. With that, I'll go ahead and throw it back out. Any questions on any of the topics or any of the 
items I've thrown out here or any other ideas? Hi, Michael Zekin. Yep. So yep. I've been thinking, um, so uh, if you are just like giving a McQuillan to a container or VM directly, then yep. it, it really works well. Um, so when it starts getting all a bit more messy is, is if, you're, if you want a bit more flexibility, so like you want, all right, but I do want like two of these cards, and I want maybe for for availability. Uh, I want like failover between them, um, stuff like that. Then it's suddenly you you would layer like a maybe OVS or uh, right. uh, some other software device on top of Macvillan, and then where, where normally, for example, you would put like a single OVS on top of a physical device, and then that has all the logic in one place. So suddenly we would need like a ton of bridges, um, a single one on top of every uh, every McQuillan, and suddenly part of the configuration is a McQuillan, part of it is an OVS, and it, it it looks at least messy and probably limits us in various ways. Um, like if we could somehow magically, you know, just um, have ability to, for example, you know, connect uh, OVS, connect VMs through it, and have it use VMDQ uh, when it can for offloads. That would solve some of these issues. It's probably science fiction, but I don't have better ideas. But the problem is there, I feel. So actually, yeah, what you're describing, actually that's, so like one of the things I had mentioned is like extending support to regular VLANs, it sounds like what, th what you're describing sounds more like, okay, we need to extend this for OVS, basically is what it comes down to. To where OVS could go ahead and say, this device, give me some cues, and I'm going to put this Mac filter on it and hand it off, and I'll do the, you know. I don't actually need a true net device in that case. I would just have to have OVS reaching down and doing the manipulation, which I think that should be a possibility, although I'll have to double check. That actually changes some of the things because then it becomes a instead of new uh, instead of needing the NDO ops like pointer um, for just Mac VLAN, it, we still might need to keep like the open close bits that are there for Mac VLAN already or in the NDO ops in the NDO ops. Just keep them generic in that case. So actually, that sounds yeah, that'd be an interesting idea. Yeah, so I made a note of that. So. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't even need notes then. Yeah. Okay. So I, I was kind of confused about the XPS queue selection. Yep. Is Mac VLAN still a single queue or multiple queues now? Mac VLAN itself, right. the actual device is single queue. Right. But in the lower dev, it can be represented by multiple queues, and that's where um, I, the, I added a bit of trickiness to it. And so that's the thing: is the the Mac VLAN itself says as long as it's a single queue that you add, then it can be offloaded. And the lower dev says, okay, I'm going to allocate four queues to it. And if you want to, you can configure XPS on the lower dev for those four queues. And they're isolated. And so what you'll end up with is you can see it. And uh, the, it'll report a TC value of like negative something, um, which is supposed to indicate the pool that it belongs to. If, or, or no, is it negative? I'm trying to remember now. I coded it up three weeks ago and I went on vacation. So it's like I can't remember now the exact details of it. But... Um, yeah, it ends up reporting it out. And I think there's a, it does like a, a pull number dash, or pull number dash something, I think. Yeah, that's right. Because I ended up just basically cheating and using the, the HDTV channel specifications, what popped into my head. So it was like pull number dash and then actual TC, if I remember right. Um, or the other way around. I can't remember the exact details of it. I'd have to double check the code. Um, but yeah, ideally, um, what it is is the Mac VLAN doesn't know it has these hardware cues backing it. It's one of the things I wanted to avoid. Just we have some of that abstraction still. So if you put some uh, Mac VLAN in a container, it doesn't have direct information about the lower device because you want to still have that abstraction. Um, but yeah, the, the current code as it stands, you can do XPS on the queues for the Mac VLAN on the lower dev, but you can't do it on the Mac VLAN itself. And it's actually storing that in the XPS map for the, uh, or in the, 
NetDev for the Mac VLAN in order to get there. And it's using the TXQ subordinate device pointer to figure out, oh, okay, I'm actually enslaved to that. So if we have to look up the XPS map, I go look at that device to get it back out. So it's kind of, yeah, it ends up being a little bit of a roundabout way, but it's only in the uh, queue configuration that it really comes up. So it shouldn't have much of a penalty in terms of the fast path bits. Then I had to rebase it off of Amritha's recent patches that went and added uh, the receive queue stuff. because that was the one thing that's like, oh, I got to rebase my patches now. So that's where we stand with that. But yeah, it does XPS now and uh, you can actually do, uh, there was it? There's the TC to Q mapping. So technically now it also has DCB support-ish. It ends up defaulting to just whatever the uh, Q config is for the lower device right now by default. So any other questions, comments? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we ripped through that one pretty quick. So we'll have to see. We might end up with about a half hour at the current rate. So. Okay. Of course, then again, yeah, we'll have to see. Um, this one's been quite a hot topic on the mailing list the last few months. Uh, SROV using pair virtualization as a standby path. So um, what was it about? I think it was back around December, the first time this got put out. Basic idea here um, is you want to provide a way to have VertIO or yeah, so back in December we submitted this. The basic idea was you want to have a generic way for VertIO to enslave a VF. The idea being we want to have an easy way to put together a VM, have it accelerate itself via SRIOV when it was available, and otherwise just let it go. And so the original design we actually had based off of the approach that Microsoft is using with NetVSC. Um, what they were doing is their paravirtual driver would go and check and see if there was any interfaces out there with the same MAC address as its. And if there were, it would go out and say, okay, you're my VF now, and I'm going to take ownership of you, and I'm gonna dump traffic down you as long as you're there. And so what we ended up doing is essentially taking a lot of the code that was already there in NetVSC, porting it over um, to VertIO, um, and then uh, that way we could end up you know, with the same kind of model, similar look and feel type thing. Um, and then that led to a lot of emails. Uh, basically what a lot of it came down to is a lot of people had different ideas about how the model should look. Um, Microsoft's model used um, what we refer to as the two driver, two net dev model. They would have the VF and the net VSC. And so if you go to transmit, it would go through net VSC queue disk and get into the um, VF's Q disk and then out to the wire. Um, we had some internal discussion about, I wasn't a fan of that, but it's what was there for NetVSC. They wanted to try to go ahead with that. Um, eventually what we ended up going with though, and this is actually more the model I was a fan of, is the three net dev model. Um, the idea there is you had some sort of uh, bonding type interface and it's not actually bonding just to be clear. Jerry's listening somewhere, it's not bonding. I agree, it's not bonding, it's not teaming. It's something else. It looks kind of like active backup, but um, that's about as close as it gets to bonding. Um, let's see. So what we ended up doing there is we switched from that two net dev model to the three net dev, and there was a bunch of back and forth about you know, naming where the code should go. We had a, was it, I think, by the time we were done, I think we ended up with one shared kernel library type file-ish, a new kernel module uh, for the, uh, the VertIO driver, or not for, uh, not for the VertIO, for the <coughs> Vert bonding driver, well, not Vert bonding, because that's the wrong name, but yeah, the, uh, was it the failover. failover driver, yes. So I still want to think of it as bypass. I always preferred the name bypass instead of failover, but... Yeah, the, the failover driver. Um, and so really what we ended up with is like a three and a half driver model and uh, three net devs, which still there's a lot of discussion going on in the list about, okay, how can we hide net devs, which that's another thing that can really get the community going when you start saying, oh yeah, we want to hide stuff from the user. That always real, goes over real well. Anyway, so that patch sets um, 
the uh, the three and a half net or three and a half driver three net dev model is what's upstream in the kernel now. Um, there's still work that has to be done though. So what's left to do? Um, my, the kernel bits, like I said, are done, but the QEMU still needs to get changed so that we, it can actually advertise support for this. Um, and last I knew, Red Hat's the one that's taken ownership of that. Yeah, because that's the thing is like Shreedar had the, the, the like one line patch and it sounds like he's kind of handed that off to you. So I just wanted to make sure for the public forum this way, you know, it's on video. You said Red Hat sort of taken ownership for it. So yeah, 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 I didn't realize, but I guess, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that's the thing is, yeah, oh, good that's one of the things I wanted to make sure of. And so that's why it's like, it's, this is a good form to take care of that. It's like, okay. So it's otherwise, Sridhar, the person sitting next to you, yeah. Oh, we assumed you are taking care of this. All right. <laughs> yeah, because that's the thing is, yeah, he assumed you were taking care of it. It's like, are you sure? So I figured this is a good form to just put it out there. And it's like, okay, if he's not, we're going to hear it. So. so that's why it's not making progress. <laughs> now I understand. Well, that... Well, there's discussion about pairing, but not... Uh, yeah, um, that's the thing is, yeah, I think it's kind of gotten off into a bunch of rat holes. Cause it's like yep. that loose way, always talking about, okay, hiding this or pairing via that. And it's like, okay, so we need, it sounds like we do need to figure out exactly what the path is going forward for that and who owns what. Actually, okay. Yeah, just pass the mic back and forth. <laughs> yep. So, it's on. Yeah, it's on. Okay. Uh, actually, can we just at least get the QMU patch in with just with the standby bit so that uh, a controller or some administrator can uh, do the management via some scripting until we get the final solution with the libvirt and QMU changes? So if you want to um, control the visibility of the standby, uh, or no, of the primary, right. um, externally, that's possible. But then you need to expose a bunch of internal QME information to that external controller. I can see it, this kind of patch getting applied but it's not what has been posted. There's, right now, there's not enough information for an external controller to do the right thing. Yeah, so you're talking about external to the guest or from the guest side? Okay, yeah, so from the QMU side. Yes. Uh, hello, so I'm from Microsoft. Uh, one of the reason we did the uh, actually the s switch between the VF and the NetVSC is that uh, uh, in case of Hyper-V, uh, actually the synthetic pass, the NetVSC is active at all time, so it's active simultaneously as the VF driver. So because uh, in our model, the Broadcast, multicast, and the TCP packet with the same flag, they still go go through the NetBSC. So they, they don't go to the VF. So actually both of the interface is active. So my question is for you is uh, in the in case of your what IO driver, so when you use the VF, uh, does that uh, take uh, all of the packet? So the the PV driver is uh, completely idle when you use uh, VF. Is that the case? Mm, somewhat. So that's where this gets. So I'll go ahead and move on to the next slide because we're kind of getting into that. So the big issue, so we basically took care of the guest side of all of this with, the, with those patches. The problem is it didn't take care of anything external. And this is kind of what we were getting into now. Is everything outside of QEMU, it, it becomes how do you configure it? Um, in my mind, to some extent, a lot of this could get simplified real quick by just setting up a couple things to prevent loops from the pair virtual to the um, uh, VF interface. 
Uh, but for things like broadcast multicast, then you end up with both receiving the same broadcast if it comes from an outside source. And so that's one thing we still have to work on with some of this yet, I think. And so like one thing I was actually debating is at some point looking at doing, and this would be, is it or in the audience anywhere? Oh, okay. So I can talk it. Well, he's probably watching online. So it's looking at maybe extending legacy SRLV, see if we can get away with that to allow support for um, disabling broadcast and multicast on the VF. Because um, then doing something like that, we could look at a model more like what you've described, where in it would be at least the broadcast and multicast could go the pair virtual path. And so we could avoid doing the um, packet replication and eating, eating up all the extra PCIe bandwidth for SRIOV that way. And then I'd just end up leaving the unicast traffic to just go straight through the VF as it is with the uh, existing hardware filtering. Um, and so that would help to take care of some like the east-west traffic and all of that. The other thing we could look at doing like, if I'm not mistaken, the Microsoft approach right now ends up sending everything from the guest down, in, uh, down the VF interface, if I understand it correctly. I think from the guest, everything goes down the VF, but coming back, it, it takes care of the broadcast, multicast, and you said the TCP SYN requests all come in on the para-virtual interface, right? Uh, yes, you are correct. Which, yeah, so I'd probably be looking at doing something similar to that. The only thing I have questions about is whether there'd be any advantage also looking at doing some sort of um, trick to push all the broadcast, multicast down the para-virtual interface as well. Just because then if you're doing replication, you you'd only have to do it in software and you could just hopefully just be able to send out the PF without having to uh, actually do any uh, replication in software. Well, I guess you still having to do the replication is just earlier, so. Uh, the question is, is uh, the replication a real concern? And one of the issues we see with SRIOV is you do broadcast or multicast and you have 64 VFs, yeah. your PCIe bandwidth goes but only, because only for a pathological, um, uh, like, uh, benchmark case, right? In the real world application, you're going to do ARP or something every once in a while and well, running a... Well, some cases, yes. The problem is there are specific use cases that do things like use multicast traffic all over the place. And like in our, the case of our hardware, it's like a shared filter table for all the multicast. So if anybody is listening on multicast, everyone's listening on multicast. So like IXGBE has this issue, for instance, and so. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I agree with that, but <clears throat> to avoid that particular problem, you're gonna create a huge complication because you're now going to have to examine packets on the TX path, which you don't want to be able to do, right? Like the whole, the simplicity of being TX mapped into a, like why have SRRV in the first place then, right? The whole point is you're creating a dedicated queue up to the guest, let it go out. On the receive path, you have a native hook to be able to do the multicast broadcast right. filtering. And, and that's where the exposure really is, right? The network can flood you with multicast and broadcast, which you cannot control. Within your own domain, you're, you're restricted to your own domain. You cannot right. generate multicast or broadcast from more than your own, own peers. So yeah. Yeah, it keeps it's it a lot simpler to not try to complicate the TX. Yeah, the only reason I was thinking about is we, we already have a, uh, in the case of uh, you know the three net dev model, we, we end up with the, uh, an extra net dev in between, so it becomes okay in the transmit path in that case. I have to do like, there's like what, three, four different tests that we're doing before it actually sends it out the wire just to make sure that the PF, or the, sorry, the VF exists and all that before I can send it out the VF. I'm just wondering how much it would actually cost us to look at one bit in the destination MAC address and go, okay, is this a multicast packet? Yep, okay, don't even bother with that other stuff. I'm just gonna send it straight down. So I, w I would go down the path of removing the three checks that you have, right? Like trying to make it so that you go to the, like move everything to initialization time rather than a runtime check. Well, some of it, you can't be helped because you're having to check whether or not the link exists on the uh, lower device, let basically. It fail, let it fail, handle it on the, on the failure handler path, right? There's no, I mean, unless you're going to take a null exception or a null pointer check, you don't have to really put it in the data path. Yeah, except for customers tend to get really upset when they start losing packets. And so, 
Yeah, you know, it, it's an honest statement. Yeah, and that's usually the answer I give, and then it comes no, I don't, back. I'm surprised I'm yeah. arguing with you, Alex, on this. <laughs> You're yeah. the one looking for cash line misses, but um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would go in that direction. The whole point of doing. Well, yeah, it, it, it's optimized wherever possible, but in this case, it's one of those things where, yeah, we it the the penalty you pay for dropping packets tends to get pretty significant. So it's like, okay, try to avoid it wherever possible. So it's like performance, but at the same time, stability is basically the, the trade off. Sure, but you're handling, I mean, you already have the mux that's going to make the choice. Right? I mean, we, we can take this off. Yeah. But the point is, don't, don't, because there's already a hook, don't add, make the hook more. Well, this, this is just, uh, yeah, th this is transmit side only that I'm talking about for these hooks. So, um, anyway, let's see. And yeah, so like, like I mentioned before, so one of the other things that came up, that's come up multiple times, is how can we hide these devices? We want to make it look like one net dev for all of this. And it's like, I don't know. This is one where I can see it sort of from the usability standpoint, but the engineer in me is like, no, 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 leave all the switches and levers there so we can, you know, if this train goes off the track, we can just put it right back on the track without any problems and we can see that it's gone off the track. Um, and so, yeah, there's that, that one. And then, yeah, uh, like I mentioned, one of the other things that's come up in discussions now is uh, means of identifying paired devices other than the MAC address. We've had a lot of discussions about it. Like one of the things we were talking about is was exposing some sort of PCI bridge-like thing inside QEMU to say, okay, everything above this bridge is going to be paired as one logical net device. Um, there's like uh, serial number type things that have been discussed, I think. Um, there's just a lot of different ways we can go with all of that. And so with that, any thoughts on, any other thoughts on any of this? <coughs> No. Yeah, can you guys, can you pass the mic back? So I think for, for all the switch dev things, um, it's more a question of someone, you know, just trying to come up with an exhaustive list of things and then kind of prototyping and saying, all right, so this works, let's try to, to support this. This really doesn't give a huge benefit, so defer it. Um, like the, the reason we, we, we have the, what we have is that it's like kind of obviously a, a, a basic thing that obviously helps. Right. Um, but if like, if we have a, at least a list of things that do help, then I don't see. Uh, I think that just no one really bothered is the, is the only reason we don't yet have that. Um, and for hiding, I just wonder whether maybe <coughs> somehow we should uh, like do something like support. All right, this device, if you see it automatically, hide it, put it in the namespace. Right. Uh, I just create a new namespace that's the okay, these are my slaves and my group or something like that. Right. And Unix, Linux uh, does some, sometimes does, does know how to play with namespaces in the kernel. Most namespaces are in the, uh, ma managed by user space, but it's not kind of, you know, out of the question. Right. Actually, yeah, that, that would probably work. Instead of hiding, just basically put it in a side namespace somewhere. Okay, yeah. that's something to think about because yeah, then you end up exposing within the guest just the one bond that comes out of that namespace. Create it in that namespace and basically expose it uh, by via yeah, migration. Okay, yeah. And if it's like a, a bridge, then maybe you can tie, like have a bridge driver create that namespace. Right. I mean, right now, what we are designing is uh, a bridge with a special vendor and device ID. Yeah. So it's not a question to have a driver upload it besides a regular PCI bridge driver. Right. Have that do things. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so that can be something to think about because, huh. Yeah, we might have to. That does leave you some control. Right, because yeah, because then it's the, the interfaces are still there. They're not actually hidden. It's just they're in a side namespace, and so essentially, 
Yeah, so we'd have to change the existing patch so that would basically create that namespace, shunt off the vert IO and the VF over to that namespace, and then expose the new uh, bonding interface, or the bond bridge, whatever it is, in its place. That might work, okay. Yeah, so the, so the question is, we, uh, we would essentially have a forwarding namespace that uh, contains the interfaces that are being logically combined to create the new one. And yeah, that's what I think we're talking about here, is creating a, a custom namespace that those two So the idea is really the namespace becomes a control point. That's, I mean, it, it right. hopefully doesn't create a, you're not really looping the packet through another namespace handler that would no. actually kill people. So it, it would actually work a lot like Mac VLAN, only yeah. in this case it takes the original interface, shunts it off to the, the original right. interfaces, shunts them off and says, okay, here's this Mac VLAN-like thing. So the grouping control is presented through sort of a namespace that's as right. assigning the, the combination device, if you will, or the, right. whatever, whatever you called it, the fail, failover device? Yeah, the, the, the VF and the vert IO sure. would both go into this failover namespace, sure. and then you get the failover device, which is actually the one that picks which one it's actually talking to, is what would be left behind, uh, exposed in the original namespace. Sure. I mean, it, uh, the one thing to think about is that will work really well for the Intel type devices that you guys are having, for right. people who are going to be able to do some of these things for real in hardware you want to build in the context of switch dev and everything else. Uh, a thing that allows you to not need the software layering such that you can actually offload all of this, right? If a device could do all the things you're talking about, you want to be able to give it the same set of controls so that the end user experience remains the same. Right. You could, you could argue that you could do that with the namespace design, right? You could say that. Well, that's the thing. Is to some extent, what we're trying to do with this is actually keep it looking like Vert.io. So we're not necessarily exposing correct, correct. the VF features. Yeah, it correct. becomes the, okay, try to expose as many of the Vert.io features or basically the intersection thereof as possible. Yeah, yeah I like it. I, I, I get it. I like it. It right. sounds, sounds smart. Yeah, because that actually, the, the namespace solution actually solves a lot of that because that was my big concern is the, okay, something breaks. How do I get under the hood now to fix it? And if it's just in a namespace, I can go crawl into the namespace and go check those interfaces and then take a look at and see what's going on. And can you pass the, Michael, uh, the, the uh, microphone back to me? Oh. So okay. uh, Florian had been working on some hidden device flag, right? Is that, so you want these exposed to user space or you? Well, ideally um, the net dev interfaces shouldn't go away. Just for debugging purposes, I should have some way to access them. I do want to, okay. And so I want to still have them there so I can find them somehow. I just don't need them right there in the front. I would prefer to have them in the back. And if we shunt them into another namespace, that would work in that uh, regard. Because it's just. Yeah, just making sure, even though I suggested it, I didn't volunteer to. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can probably get, see if we can get, was it loose way to uh, work on that? We might suggest that to him if he's watching. If nothing else, we can e email him on it on the list. So that was the thing he was uh, excited about. He wanted to have a way to actually hide the net devs. So. Yeah, actually, I am not completely clear how this will work. If you move the lower net devices to a different namespace, yep. and if the upper device is trying to send a packet, uh, it would work just like how we use Mac VLANs now, where we create a Mac VLAN and then we move it to another namespace. Only in this case, it's the the VertIO creates this new interface and then it shunts itself off to the other namespace. Is basically what it comes down to. It moves itself and the VF. And so it's just kind of the backwards logic of what we do right now for Mac VLAN. So right now, it's we, we create the Mac VLAN and we move it. So now it's going to be we create the failover and then we move the original device. And so it'll have a pointer to the original device so it can just send straight across and ignore the namespace, if I'm not mistaken. So it knows how to get there. And it should be able to send it across, I think. I'll have to work out the logistics, but. Yeah, we need to try it out, actually. Yeah. Yep. I think if it works out, it is a good solution, actually. Yeah. Yep. User will not be seeing the other lower net devices. Right. Let's see. We're doing. How are we doing for time? Okay, we're doing good. Yeah. Not doing. Going too fast. So this last one is more of a um, a, a topic that's you know it's meant to be, uh, inform somewhat. So even I'm not 100%, I think Michael might actually know more about this than I do, possibly, just because I know you've had to review a lot of patches in regards to a lot of this stuff. 
you may have heard things and you may not know that you know as much about it as you might, so we'll see. Um, so VHOST Data Path Acceleration, what is it? Um, it's a method for allowing a para-virtual device to, or, well, it's not really a true para-virtual device. It's a VF that's pretending to be a para-virtual device um, to do uh, direct packet I.O. Yeah, o over physical hardware. So basically, um, what it's doing is it's, uh, it's a way of direct assigning a VF that's emulating bits of vert I.O. Um, such that the control path can remain emulated, but the data path is completely passed through. Um, so essentially uh, what it's doing, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the VFIO MDEV framework, um, but basically what it does is it allows you to define a device that's a pure software abstraction with bits of hardware thrown in, just to essentially speed up certain aspects of it. So you can define certain pages as being purely emulated in the device and certain pages as being actual direct assign. And so doing that, you can get a mix of emulation and direct assign. And in theory, that allows you to get away with a little bit more to where you can do things like theoretically live migration, which is something that's been an issue with SROV for a while. So what's left to do? My understanding is there isn't a lot that's actually been applied for it at this point. There's a lot of works like when this actually caught, this actually caught me a bit by surprise. Um, within Intel, I started getting pulled into stuff where it's like, oh, we need to support SRIOV on VertIO. And it's like, what? Uh, it's a pair of virtual interface. It's not supposed to support SRIOV. And it's like, well, we've got the dis device. It looks just like VertIO, but it does SRIOV as a PF. Okay. And so you might have seen patches for me to actually get that or try to enable that and then uh, uh, it got handed off to, and I'm gonna probably uh, mess up the name, is like Tawei Bai. I can't re uh, remember the exact pronunciation of it, but um, he was working on it. And basically what we're looking at doing is this device ends up essentially exposing what looks like a VertIO interface as the PF. And then when you turn on SRIOV, it'll also expose it as the VFs. Um, the idea is you take one of these VFs, you um, chop it up using the uh, MDEV framework, and you can assign the data path directly into the guest and still use um, the emulated bits so you can get access back to figure out what the current state of the device is supposed to be. And if you throw in some page tracking in the device itself or via DPDK, this is going to be the dirty word, you know, DP. The original implementation for this is for DPDK, so just be forewarned for that. Um, but the idea is they were trying to do page tracking so that then you could migrate and actually track the pages that were gonna be DMA'd into, and the whole thing could actually um, move over without an issue. Um, so there's a bunch of work. So like the initial patches I got for this um, I reviewed them once and uh, had some comments. Like one of the things that kind of startled me is like there's comments about blacklisting a uh, the vert IO driver in order to make it work. And it's like on the host. And it's like no, 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 no. <laughs> We're not blacklisting any drivers. So we need to work with the vert IO drivers to get all of this to work. So that's where a lot of stuff comes in where it's like okay, we have to get SROV working on vert IO in order to actually be able to spawn VFs. Okay, step one. Step two. Okay, we spawn these VFs. We spawn M. You know, we, we provide the M Dev capable VF drivers. How do you get it into the guest? Well, you're going to need a vhost backend that knows how to support that. And so that we, uh, there's been a lot of work going on on that. Um, there's been several patch sets submitted to the mailing list, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I basically I'll, I'll stop there real quick and see you know questions because this is, can be a very confusing topic and I'm probably not the best at explaining it because even I am somewhat confused by it still. So, question, comments, concerns? <laughs> yeah, you just pass it between the three of you. So I haven't looked at this much, but how do you handle things like hardware descriptor formats and things like this in this model? or? 
Well, that's the thing. Is that's the part that's not the hardware the descriptor far format. My understanding is it has to match what's in Vertio. So like, or Vertio packed but, ring. But Vertio has some expectations beyond just descriptor matching as to how the descriptors will work, what kind of notification you'll get, and all the Vertio devices. So you're saying if hardware matches Vertio specifications, then this works, right. and then and then only. Right. Okay. See, I can't even hear you from up here. So. <laughs> Sorry. That has been in the works, right? I think somebody has talked about that before. Well, yeah, the VDPA, uh, they actually presented it at the KVM forum last year, and there's been uh, several patch test sets pushed. There's just a lot of different patch sets where it's like, I'm, what I'm trying to do is basically help people put together that, oh, hey, this might be related to this, this is related to that. So like we've got, like there's the Vertio pact ring stuff going on, which is somewhat related. Um, there's the SROV support for VertIO, which is related. Um, the uh, VFIO MDEV framework, which is going to end up being related. Um, it's actually got some other things that's being used for as well, because this is kind of a new use that I wasn't aware of. Because um, uh, was it Anjali and I were presenting last year up here about you know the yeah. MDEV framework and okay you can create devices. And when I saw this, it's like okay that was something I hadn't thought about. Because this um, like like I said, one of the surprises for me is the model here is since um, it's designed to work with an IOMMU setup that doesn't support PASID. So what they're doing is they're actually taking a single VF and it spawns a single MDEV. And it's like, okay, well, I guess that sort of works. It's like it's bypassing things. It's become, the VF driver becomes its own uh, VFIO driver, essentially, so that it can go ahead and spawn this MDEV that can then go be direct assigned. And so that makes things you know, that much more complicated in terms of the setup for it, because all of a sudden it's now essentially combining the VFI, VFIO driver into the VF driver itself. Um, and so that's another thing with this representing itself as a VertIO device, uh, just the VF itself is coming up as a VertIO device, therefore now VertIO sort of has to support this. And so that's the thing is it also makes things kind of interesting, because in theory then if you're doing like nested virtualization, I guess you could, in theory, make use of this, because if we're going to represent the device as a VertIO device and support VDPA, then in the case of nested virtualization, as long as IOMU is there, you should be able to do VDPA with a standard para-virtual, you know. And so it's, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, that's why I thought this would be a good thing to bring to the workshop. This is like the, okay, now that you've, you know, I've already put you to sleep, and it's, you know, first thing in the morning, it's like, now I'll give you the, the brain twisters where it's like, okay, wait, how is this supposed to work? So yeah, like there's, like I said, there's a, still a lot of it left to do. There's a lot of patches that are in flight all over the place. You got the packed ring format, uh, SROV support, um, a vhost backend for VDPA, MDEV support for uh, VertIO, et cetera. So where could this go? So that's the thing. Is this is one of those ones where it's like, okay, this is kind of a new paradigm, kind of interesting thought. So like one of the things I actually had as a thought was what would happen if we took the VF drivers there for existing devices like IXGBE and we were to look at doing something like this where it, with it, where it's like, okay, right now it doesn't do switch dev. That's a known issue. What if we created a para-virtual device using the MDEV framework for the IXGBE VF that said, okay, I'm the VF on the host, I, and if I can find my PF, then maybe I could look at putting together a mediated device and make something that looks like switch dev. And so that's another one where it's like, okay, you know, still trying to solve the same problem. We don't, we don't do switch dev on IXGBE. How do we get there or get something that looks like it? And so this is the one thing I had that came to mind with all of it. Um, would be to create a mediated device, mediated VF for IXGBE VF that would basically kind of turn the, the net device inside out so it could you know, present itself still as a net dev on the local host, but then that would directly talk to the mediated device instead of talking to the network. Yep. So how much of the, how much smarts do the guests need for this? Is this going to be invisible where an older compiled should, guest? Should be, well, Worst case scenario is you'd have to have a driver in the guest for the mediated device is what it comes down to. It's basically the guest has to be able to know how to load on this pseudo emulated device thing that's there. 
That's what it comes down to. So if you did a perfect emulation, it doesn't need any new smarts. But if, like, so in order to support something like this, for instance, I'd probably need to add one new queue somewhere so I have a way of directly sending packets in from this, from the external net dev into the guest. So. Any other questions, comments, concerns? One question. When you yeah. say VF driver is providing switch dev like support, are you talking about DevLink? And um, are any other VF drivers supporting it today, if not Intel? Well, right now, switch dev um, is a PF specific thing. And a lot of what I was getting at is more the um, traffic management and control functionality. So like right now we don't have any port representers is one of the big issues. It becomes how do you deal with configuring things switch dev like if you don't have port representers? And so having this net dev here that I could directly put packets into and it gets received by the VF, that would at least be a step in that direction. And then I'd have to add a path to get packets out of the PF and back to this net dev to get the receive side path to be like switch dev. But then it would just be okay, I change something on the settings here. And then the VF would be actually acting as an in-between, essentially, between the PF or as an abstraction that talks to the PF to configure the actual true VF. <laughs> and so, yeah, a lot of this is just, you know, very pie in the sky, you know, what if scenarios, moonshot stuff. So, yeah, I start at nuts and bolts and take it to moonshot by the time I'm done, so... <laughs> well, you, you got to start at the ground and it's like, okay, Establish the foundation and then you build the rocket. You don't just like build the rocket and oh, oops, built it on sand, falls over, you know. So um, there's this old idea where you um, partition a device, um, assign, pass it to each partition, and then you can in a safe way, using IMMU uh, protections right. uh, by using the passive, you can have users, many user spaces right. drive the same device. Yep. And the same applies right. for VMs as for user spaces. Right. And I just wonder whether anyone's still looking at that. That's still being worked on. This is more the existing solution before we get the uh, IOMMUs with PASID support. <coughs> and so that's the thing is that's where this is coming coming from it's the okay what can we do with the existing stuff that's out there now versus the stuff that'll be out in a few more years because yeah that's still be, all that stuff's still being worked on and so that's the thing is like when this came up it's like the okay um it's going to confuse people because we've got this and this other thing that's coming up now and they're going to look a lot alike except for there's these extra steps, and so it's going to be a, a matter of distinguishing between uh, uh, that version of mediated device support versus this. Um, another one that's actually kind of come up is what's to keep us from doing a just pure emulated mediated device? Instead of actually backing it with hardware, what if we just did a, a pure emulated mediated device instead of having like a Mac VTAP, it becomes Mac V... Uh, I don't know, Mac V M dev, where essentially it would, you would just be feeding packets directly into a media device instead of a tap backend. Um, that's something that we've been discussing as well as um, what that should look like. Because one of the problems there is it becomes, okay, how long before we have a slippery slope and everybody's putting their own emulation in there so they can expose their own VF to user space, you know. So that's another possibility is we could go for just a pure emulated device and just use that for uh, an MDEV. That's, you know, another moonshot type thing. So thoughts, comments, concerns? Well, it looks like I probably came up a half hour short, went about 20 minutes each, it looks like. Oh, yeah, I so I can ask tangent questions? Yep. Okay. Now you can eat up as much time as you want. <laughs> You know, the, is the, I, I, I couldn't tell from your Mac Villain uh, slides whether you have, the, there was an issue with the Intel drivers, I think, maybe it's just Intel, that um, when you added a new Mac Villain device, you had to 
I've config bring IP link down the device admin down basically. Is that you had to down it or it just reset itself? I think yeah, it, started, it dropped traffic basically. Yeah, is that that is a hardware issue, right? I guess that's not. Well, it, it's so basically what it came down to. This is actually one of the things I went through and was trying to fix. Right. Instead of doing it every time you add a Mac VLAN, right. um, I went and changed it so we have like three modes that we go through. Right. Um, the limitation of the hardware in the case of IXGBE is that it has to configure the queues into a state of where it can support RSS. So there, there's a couple ways to solve it. One would be to turn on Mac VLAN and everything's limited to single queue Mac VLAN, which the problem is then you don't get you know, the scalability and performance you want. So what I ended up doing is we have three modes that we end up supporting right now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, first one is everything up to 15 Mac VLANs, um, and it'll do four queues per Mac VLAN. Second one is up to 31 Mac VLANs, and that's two queues per Mac VLAN. And the last one ends up being 64, or 63 with a queue per Mac VLAN, the single queue. And it'll just basically ramp up like that, and it just locks in at that point. And then you, if you delete Mac VLANs until you turn off the Mac VLAN offload, you're basically stuck in that single queue per Mac VLAN mode. Okay. Um, yeah, and actually one thing I changed, which uh, I actually changed this, I think, a release ago or whatever. There was a bit in the user space that confused me and I didn't like where uh, I think the original implementation John did was using the number of queues on the Mac VLAN to define the number of queues the hardware is supposed to try to allocate, but it was just causing issues. Like the default behavior, the, the two wouldn't match, the driver would take a look and go, nope, I'm not using that number of queues and just reject it. And it's like, there's no explanation as to why. And it's like, okay. In my case, that got in the way actually having multiple queues on the Mac VLAN. So I made it instead that we only offload on IXGBE if a single queue uh, Mac VLAN is requesting the offload. Because it doesn't make much sense to have the extra queues on the Mac VLAN interface anyway, since it's not actually, it doesn't have queuing disciplines of its own. It's running in no queue anyway. So it's like, okay, tell it it only has a single queue. I can just pass through that real quick and then uh, use the extra fields out of the device in order to make use of that. Hello. Yeah. Yep. TC, field, TC filter offload is. TC filter offload still works. Okay. U32, right? Uh, for IXGBE, yes, I believe it's U32. Okay. Well. Uh, there is one problem, it's really only loosely related to what you were talking about, but it's, I've been wondering for some time. Uh, if you imagine the interface used by IP to uh, query uh, the VF information, right. uh, we are running into some kind of a problem there because uh, given the size of the IFVF info, uh, attribute and the number of uh, VFs supported by, by some of current cards, uh, we can soon uh, exceed the 64 kilobyte limit for the uh, container attribute, IF VF info list or what is the name. So is this something that we should address or we just say, okay, this is legacy, we are moving to switch dev? Well, if, if there's a bug like that, we, that should probably get addressed because any, anything uh, that No, no, no. It, no. It's not a bug. The problem is that uh, uh, by my calculation, given uh, current uh, size of the uh, VF info attribute, right. uh, if a network card has uh, something like, I think, 270 VFs, uh, the IF VF info list size would uh, exceed the 64 kilobytes limit, which is a hard limit for any right. link attribute. Okay. So we are not there yet, but right. if there are more VFs or the size of the VF info grows further right. by adding some information, we would run into this. So okay. So yeah, so really in that situation, then the, yeah, it becomes a question of do we want to support more than 250 some, say 256, let's keep it a nice 8-bit value. Do we want to support more than 256 VFs in a, a legacy SRLV mode setup? 
Would that be a good way to summarize it, essentially, due to this VF info problem? Yeah. Or another problem is if it uh, VF info size grows further by adding some more information. Right. Okay. Then we, it could happen with say two hundred and forty or. Well, that's the thing. So hopefully, you know, the legacy is supposed to be locked down, in theory. So we'll see how that goes. Um, if that's the case, it shouldn't grow. But at the same time, yeah, it becomes the supporting legacy with 256 or more VFs. So that's something that we will probably have to take up on the mailing list in order to really discuss because that's the problem is I don't, yeah, we don't have Orr here. So, and he's kind of the switch dev side of all this. Um, so, yeah, so, but we're, uh, it's on video now. So, yeah, <laughs> this is something that we have to address. We'll have to address it and just, just make a decision as a community which way we want to go on that. So I could easily see, see the simple solution being, okay, yeah, if it's more than 256, you have to go with like switch dev or whatever. So maybe we could do some limitation like that. Maybe not. We'll have to see. Just depends on how the vendors want to handle it. So I can only speak for Intel and it's like, okay, yeah, that would have to be fixed, but maybe we just look at going with switch dev instead for something like that. Then it just make a hard limit for legacy of 256, but I'll have to decide on the mailing list. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Well, let's thank uh, Alex. Thank okay, there's a few public announcements. Let's thank Cumulus for, we have very limited number of remote access where we'll probably see participants <coughs> later on. Uh, thanks to Cumulus for sponsoring the video. Uh, wireless, everybody's on wireless and it's good. I know it's more important than food, so no complaints, right? IPsec workshop is going to happen at 10.30, uh, one floor down from here. Is everybody on the people at NetDevConf mailing list? Because we've been sending instructions there. So if you're attending and you want to participate in the tutorial, download the uh, image and follow the instruction and we're all good, right? Yeah, I guess we finished uh, this about an hour, 10 minutes. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. 20 minutes short. Yeah, so you're free till the next, next session starts at 10.30, thanks. <laughs>